Police department. Yes, please send somebody over here. My husband's laying at the side of the house. I don't know what's the matter. Is somebody shot him or what? On June 19, 1989, Livonia Police Sergeant Donald Vandersloot responds to a home on Seven Mile Road where a man has been shot. The victim is Xavier Giller, the 67-year-old owner of a Detroit cab company. Mr. Giller's body was lying here on the concrete. His head was down in this area. His feet were pointing at this area toward the street. And right on the concrete, literally right next to his right hand, was a 38 caliber revolver. Giller had discharged two rounds at apparent self-defense, but missed his attacker. A check inside the home provides police with a possible motive for the shootout. It appeared to be an obvious robbery that was in progress. They were laying things out on the bed in preparation of taking them. The robbery motive is bolstered when detectives find ransacked drawers. It looked as though the homeowners then, um, uh, Xavier Giller and his wife, Catherine Giller, had come home uh, perhaps a little earlier than these individuals had anticipated and, and surprised them in the act. At least three guns are reported stolen from the home. Vandersloot is unable to track down the stolen guns and is left with little in the way of physical evidence at the crime scene. Fortunately, we had no fingerprints whatsoever, identifiable fingerprints in the house or anywhere else. The best lead, it seems, comes from the victim's wife, Catherine Giller, who narrowly escaped death herself that night. I went over to the light switch to turn it on and that's when this man stepped out of the dining room, big, tall person. His head almost touched the archway. And he says, don't touch it, or I'll waste you right here. Catherine Giller was knocked unconscious, but is able to provide police with a description of her attackers. Mrs. Giller told us that she saw two men when she walked into the house bringing in groceries through the back door, that there were two men in her kitchen. Uh, a taller one, tall, skinny one with a beard, and uh, someone that she described as a shorter individual. I was told that he was bragging that he had a million dollars in the safe at his house, and the type of people that he worked with and that um, associated with down at the cab company were kind of the type of people that you might not want to tell that information to. Vandersloot questions more than 50 men before all leads are exhausted and the case goes cold. It's been my experience over the years that whenever there are two people or more involved, sooner or later one of them is going to tell somebody. On December 7th, 2004, Bonnie Swoboda gets a call. While the female caller mentions the name Gilliam, the tales tell Bonnie the call is really about her father, Xavier Giller. She said, is this where Mr. Gilliam owned the company and got shot? And he has a couple of sons. And I says, no, actually, he has four sons and a daughter. And I'm the daughter. And I says, and you are? She says, I have information um, regarding your dad's death and that you're going to find out by Christmas. The caller tells Bonnie she lives in California, but offers little more before hanging up. Sergeant Corey Williams jumps on the lead. He traces the call to a phone number in California and dials it up. I knew it was a matter of time they would find me. Sergeant Williams finds himself on the line with a woman who's nervous at first, but ready to spill a story of murder. I'm going to tell you everything. This whole story is so detailed. You're going to understand why I'm afraid, OK? How about you just relax and take your time? Tell me the whole story. She told me that. Um, she fell in love with the cellmate of her brother's named Richard Mutica. I, I promised him, actually, that if he became, you know, a warrior on fire for God, I would marry him. I would leave everything. I would walk away from everything I had, my marriage, and just, I would marry him. And, um, but he had to show me that he was sincere. To do that, the woman asked Richard Mutica to come clean about his past, including a murder he allegedly bragged about committing. The woman tells Sergeant Williams that Mutica replied in the form of a letter. I had his whole confession about the murder. Okay. I, I had him write the whole thing out to me. I told the truth, but said you free, only I had no idea what I was about to read. And I had her read the letter that Mutica wrote 
to her. I had her read it to me over the phone. In June or July of 1989, me and a friend went on a robbery spree that lasted about two months. During the robbery, a house on the outskirts of Detroit, things got out of control. He had told her that he left California in the spring of 89 to go on a robbery spree with a guy named Richard Lawson. According to Mutica, Richard Lawson was a former cab driver for Xavier Giller and knew his old boss had money. Lawson felt that on specific days, Mr. Gilliam would bring home the money at, of his cab company. They planned this robbery spree specifically to come to Detroit to rob Giller, knowing that he has large amounts of cash that he brings home from the cab company. Early on that day, we believed that the money was going to be brought home. He starts to describe the whole scene, how the, they break into the house and they, um, I guess the guy sh uh, hit the, the, the woman that was screaming on the head. According to Richard Mutica, the robbery ended in murder, but not at his hands. With the shotgun level at the waist, I heard Lawson say, hold it right there. And less than a second later, I heard and saw Lawson discharge the shotgun. And almost at the same time, I heard a secondary discharge of Mr. Gilliam's weapon, a handgun. Mutica may have thought the victim's name was Gilliam, but the details of the crime are without a doubt from the Giller homicide. When she started to go into the details about the murder, as she told me, it corroborated our evidence in the case. I covered the phone with my hand at one point and gave the guys behind me the thumbs up, and I said, I think this is going to be it. We knew where Richard Mutica was. He was, we identified him as being housed out in California Department of Corrections. He was in prison. Lawson, we weren't sure what state he was in, if he was even in the country. All we had was a name, Richard Lawson. The approximate distance. The 1989 arrest report out of Pennsylvania provides investigators with a lead. We knew uh, we should put a call in there to Pennsylvania to see if this is the right Richard Lawson. We were pretty sure it was, and sure enough, he was arrested with Richard Mutica. We believed that Richard Lawson was the one that pulled the trigger and planned this crime. He knew Giller had money. He knew the Giller house. Richard Lawson planned this crime. Mutica kind of stepped in and said, well, I'll tell you what happened, but uh, I, need, I need immunity. According to Mutica, when the Gillers arrived, things got out of hand. Mrs. Giller came in and Lawson confronted Mrs. Giller in the kitchen and told her not to say anything and to keep the lights off. And she's saying, uh, what do you want? What are you doing here? He's telling her to shut up. She won't listen. So he, he belts her in the face with a shotgun, knocks her out, all the way out. Mutica says Lawson then slipped outside to look for Mr. Giller. I heard Richard Lawson say, hold it right there. And right after he said that, there was a, there was a loud boom. Xavier Giller dropped to the ground. Mutica says he and Lawson panicked and immediately fled the scene leaving their victim for dead. Mutica told me that as he ran by Mr. Giller, he could hear him gasping for breath, and he says he still thinks about it today. What he was saying was, help me, please. I felt terrible, man, you know what I mean? I had to walk right by him, but he said, help me, help me, please. He tried to put up the, I think, the tough guy prison image, but he broke down a little bit. That was, he was a kid. It was a long time ago. It was a traumatic event in his life. He teared up a little bit while he was telling the story. I would not have been able to shoot that man. You know what I mean? Having the capacity to do it right now is a different story. But I was a kid and I was scared and there was no way I would have shot that man. Armed with Mutica's statement, Sergeant Corey Williams prepares to arrest his suspected trigger man, Richard Lawson. He was in a probation office in downtown San Diego. Introduced ourselves, said we're detectives from the Detroit area. Um, told him he's under arrest for the murder of Xavier Giller. Richard Lawson denies knowing Xavier Giller, but Sergeant Williams can prove otherwise. We pulled out the cab company card. It said, here's your picture on it right here. You drove a cab for their company. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember them now. And it all came back to him. <laughs> we got to a point in the conversation where it started to get a little confrontational. And I said to Lawson, did you shoot Xavier Giller? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. Not an admission, yet not a denial. What we're looking at here is a map that was drawn by Richard Mutica during our interview out in California in the Department of Corrections. The, the hand-drawn maps show the pond where Richard Lawson allegedly dumped guns stolen from the Giller home. 
Oh, the chances are next to nothing that we were going to find these guns. As it turns out, long shots sometimes pay off, big time. And I remember running down the shore, and uh, the divers were excited too. They said, we found one. We found another one. This uh, box is evidence from the Giller homicide case from 1989. This evidence includes the four guns that were found in the ponds out in New Jersey. This was the second gun found, and it's kind of corroded, but you can see the serial number right there, right here. Okay, the next gun we found was right here. Okay, this is actually the fourth gun we found. This one was in the best condition of all of them. Three of the guns are identified as being stolen from the Giller home in 1989. None turn out to be the murder weapon, but their recovery bolsters Richard Mitica's credibility as a witness. Finding these guns is what uh, made our case, made Mutica believable. Before trial begins, Moran asks Mutica to testify at a preliminary hearing, where Richard Lawson makes the prosecutor's job easier. He fires his lawyer and he, um, at the start of the testimony, and he actually asked questions of Mr. Mutica at the preliminary exam. It was kind of uh, amusing in that here Mr. Lawson thinks he's the smartest man in the courtroom, acting as his own lawyer, and he made some terrible mistakes. Instead of saying, what time did you arrive with the other person, he would say, what time did we arrive at the crime scene? What time did we do this? And what time did we do that? Uh, well, what time did we arrive at the scene? The judge kept admonishing him, you know, Mr. Lawson, you know, these, you're making admissions on the record. At one point, Lawson even provides his own detail of an area adjacent to the Giller crime scene. Yeah, it was a vacant field with trees on it. You don't remember that there was a house being built on the lot? That was an admission, in my opinion, that Mr. Lawson was at the crime scene. Because who would know that they were building a house next to the Giller home unless you were actually there? The jury is convinced and finds Richard Lawson guilty of murder. He is sentenced to life with no chance of parole.